Discussions of the sound design of Alfonso Cuaron's 2013 film Gravity often fixate on one salient feature. There's no sound in space. It's something that the film announces in its opening credits, making a kind of promise of scientific accuracy. Or, at the very least, a self-imposed aesthetic limitation that will force certain creative solutions. The question of how to represent the sound of outer space has been on filmmakers' minds at least since Stanley Kubrick gave us long stretches of silence in his 2001 A Space Odyssey. And then nine years later, Star Wars A New Hope reminded us that outer space didn't have to sound like outer space. But in this video, we're going to look at how this fairly specific aesthetic choice, to silence or not to silence in outer space, relates to a much broader issue in cinematic sound design. The tension between what's known as environmental fidelity and rhetorical intelligibility. These two fundamentally opposed approaches mean exactly what they sound like. Environmental fidelity is modeled on a fidelity or faithfulness to the environment that we see on screen while rhetorical intelligibility sacrifices such faithfulness for delivering narrative information in the most intelligible way possible. In his essay on this very topic, James Lastra shows how these two approaches to sound design are actually rooted in two distinct technologies for reproducing sound, the phonograph and the telephone. In Lastra's words, the phonograph sets as its goal the perfectly faithful reproduction of a spatio-temporally specific music performance as if heard from the best seats in the house. The telephone, in contrast, sacrifices acoustic specificity in favor of rendering speech clearly under widely varying conditions. Put differently, a fidelity approach entails that what we hear should reflect what we see. Intelligibility, on the other hand, entails that what we hear should clearly deploy narrative information. It's often the case that individual films will contain moments of both approaches. For a quick example, let's look at two different moments in Citizen Kane. The first exemplifying fidelity, and the second intelligibility. The directors of the Thatcher Memorial Library have asked me to remind you again, Mr. Thompson, yes. of the conditions under which you may inspect certain portions of Mr. Thatcher's unpublished. Notice how much reverb we're getting in this sequence. The sound of the voices gives us an impression of the high ceilinged marbled space. From his manuscript to be used by you. Well, that's all right. I'm just looking for what. And the overlapping dialogue between the two actors sacrifices our comprehension of what they're saying in favor of a kind of fidelity to natural sounding speech. In this second sequence, by contrast, pay attention to just how environmentally unfaithful the sound design is. Notice the moment when we cut to an extreme close-up of little Charles Kane's mother. That's what you think, is it, Jim? Yes. That's why he's going to be brought up where you can't get at him. Though the camera has moved physically closer to the source of the sound, That's why he's going to be brought up where you can't get at him. The volume of her voice remains the same. In fact, every voice plays at the same volume despite being closer to or farther from the camera. Tim. That's the train with all the lights on it. You going, Mom? Well, no, your mother won't be going right away, Charles, would you? The sound, then, is not painstakingly faithful to the environment that we see, but is designed to maximize the intelligibility of the dialogue. So despite Citizen Kane's innovations in the fidelity approach to sound design, we're still going to find elements of the intelligibility approach when we look and listen closely. But now I want to return to the question of fidelity and intelligibility in Gravity, a film for which the stakes of fidelity are a lot higher than that of Citizen Kane. When the film begins by announcing that there's no sound in space, it's essentially a promise of environmental fidelity. But of course, given that this film is not a science experiment, but a Hollywood narrative film, there are distinct moments when an environmental fidelity is forsaken for a kind of rhetorical intelligibility, and that's largely what I want to focus on in this opening sequence. The film opens with an orchestral drone accompanied by light choral accents. But then we start to get a crescendo of machinic sound effects. And cuts out just at the moment that the image cuts to outer space. 
Not only does the cutting out of this extreme crescendo create the impression of silence, but it also firmly entrenches us into the expectations of environmental fidelity, that what we hear should reflect what we see. Second, the sounds of the voices, whose bodies are not yet visible, are spatially divided by the speakers. The left speakers play the sounds of ground control, played by Ed Harris, and the right speakers are reserved for the astronauts, played by Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. While the directions themselves might seem somewhat arbitrary, they do in a sense correspond to what we see. Earth being on the left side of the screen, and the space shuttle being on the right. So in a sense, we are in the realm of environmental fidelity. In a similar way, the barely audible voices on the radio gradually become louder only as the spaceship gets closer. So once again, what we hear corresponds to what we see, reinforcing the fundamental principle of environmental fidelity. But there's one big problem with this way of thinking. We're not hearing the voices emanate from the environment since, as we've been told, there's no sound in space. We're hearing electrical signals process voices over radio transmission, which should not conform to the same physical principles as a voice emanating from a body in an atmosphere. In other words, radio signals wouldn't get louder as we get closer. So our best way of categorizing these sound design choices during this opening sequence is to say that they are somewhat in between fidelity and intelligibility. They're environmentally faithful to the silence of space by sonically coding the voices to sound like they're transmitted by radio. But they violate that fidelity to satisfy a desire to amplify those voices as we get closer to their embodied sources. So while gravity insists on a kind of sonic realism, promising to show us what outer space looks and sounds like, it still bends its own rules for the sake of storytelling. So far we've defined environmental fidelity with respect to the position of the camera. If the camera, in this case a virtual camera, is located in the vacuum of space, and there's no sound in space, then we shouldn't hear any sound if we want to maintain environmental fidelity. But this isn't the entire story, because we're not considering how fidelity is always anchored to a point of audition. Just as its name implies, the term point of audition is the sonic counterpart to point of view. In his writing on the topic, Michel Chion tells us that point of audition can have two different meanings, not necessarily related. First, we can mean point of audition in the spatial sense, quote, from where do I hear? From what point in the space represented on the screen or on the soundtrack? This spatial sense of point of audition is largely consistent with how we've been talking about environmental fidelity. For a fairly literal example of this, listen to the way that the camera's penetration of Ryan's helmet syncs up with a change in sound quality. We've gone from hearing Ryan's voice as a radio signal to hearing Ryan's voice within a small chamber of air. Or listen to how the camera repeatedly dunking underwater creates a similar effect. Each case imagines the camera or some visible location on screen as the point from which we hear things. But the second meaning of point of audition, the subjective sense, is importantly distinct. In Shion's words, it asks which character, at a given moment of the story, is apparently hearing what I hear. We can clearly see how this works in this example. The high-pitched ringing that we hear is certainly faithful to some kind of reality, but that reality only belongs to the character's perspective, not to any objective point in space. We can see this further if we notice how the sound of the roaring fire, and even the musical score, only re-emerge as Ryan regains consciousness. What we hear is wholly attuned to her perspective. We're still in the realm of fidelity, but it's not a fidelity to the environment so much as a fidelity to a character's subjectivity. And if we take a step back and look at the film as a whole, this is largely how gravity solves the problem of silence in the first place. So is it you're in the vacuum, sound cannot be transmitted to the atmosphere. Nevertheless, sound 
is transmitted through interaction of elements. Meaning that if our characters grab, touch stuff, the vibration of that will travel into their ears. And so they will get a muffled representation of that sound. Hearing these vibrations doesn't so much break the rule of silence as it changes the point of audition from spatial to subjective. Gravity, then, is indeed largely faithful to the silence of outer space, but this fidelity can manifest itself in a number of different ways. From an absolute silence that places the point of audition in the vacuum of space itself, to muffled sound effects that create the impression of silence, to a musical score that cleverly smuggles in pseudo sound effects to match movements on screen, they carry you too far. Listen to my voice. You need to, to radio signal dialogue that gives us precious access to narrative info without breaking the film's cardinal rule. I had a daughter. And then, of course, there are moments that break with fidelity completely. In the end, the sound design in Gravity reminds us that in sound era cinema, creating the impression of silence is rarely achieved by the mere absence of sound. In the words of film theorist Bella Balash, silence too is an acoustic effect. <laughs>